Hello everyone, I'm Stan Sorensen and uh, I'm the CEO of Sereno Scientific. Welcome to this uh, webcast which highlights our top line results of our lead drug in development, the HDAC inhibitor CS1 for the lethal disease pulmonary arterial hypertension. So the focus of Sereno, uh, we are passionate about developing new drugs that can improve quality of life and if possible, extend life expectancy. So those affected by cardiovascular disease will have the ability to play with their grandkids or live a fine life despite that they have been diagnosed with disease. Next, please. Today uh, on this webcast, I will be joined by Dr. Raul Agraval, who is Chief Medical Officer and Head of R&D, our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Bjorn Dahlöf, and our Head of Preclinical Development, Nicholas Oaks. We will all share a few slides with you over one and a half hour and uh, approximately, and at the end of that period, we'll have uh, a few questions that we have received from the audience and we expect the analyst perhaps to uh, pose one or two questions that we do our best to answer for you. Next. So a few words about Sereno Scientific. The company was founded 2012 and we believe we are pioneering the epigenic modulation through HDAC inhibition for cardiovascular diseases with a disease modifying potential. We have two programs with HDAC inhibitor of which we will focus on our lead program CS1 today where we have completed the phase two trial in PH which has been run in the US at 10 clinics. We will also uh, refer to our second program, CSO14, and some data that are very exciting for our programs uh, as we move forward. Um, our pipeline is actually three programs. So the second program, CSO14, is currently in a phase one trial being run in Sweden, and we expect that trial to be done by summer next year. The third program we have is a novel preclinical prostacycline receptor agonist, CS585, that we have licensed in from University of Michigan, with whom we've had a collaboration effort going on for four years. We're listed on NASDAQ, First North Growth Market. Next, please. So looking at our portfolio, of course, as a biotech, we'd like for, first and foremost that our ambitions and hard work will result in a benefit for the patients. Uh, but the road to that benefit to the market and to the patient, sometimes it will be done through collaborations, co-developments, or even trade sales of our assets to uh, partners in the industry. Um, so we are developing our drugs, our three development programs to be attractive for not only the patients, but also for collaborative partners. So if you look at our portfolio here to the right, we have a pH program, which we will focus on today with our lead drug CS1, but we also then have a portfolio uh, with our two programs, CSO14 and CS1. Uh, in addition, we have a thrombosis prevention portfolio where we have seen that we can prevent thrombosis without increasing bleeding risk uh, in uh, our animal work that has been pursued at University of Michigan on both drugs. Uh, thrombosis is the number one killer in the world and bleeding is a very strong unmet need on that market. Next, please. So what are the latest news? You probably, if you're in this webcast, you have seen the latest press releases. I just want to reflect on those. So in our program in PH, in phase two, uh, we have actually um, uh, applied and gotten approval from the FDA for extended access program of CS1 in PH patients that have completed the trial uh, with CS1 that we just have completed. So 
Uh, this provides the opportunity for patients to get access to the drug way before it is uh, introduced to the market. And the judgment here by physicians in the trial and by patients uh, from willing to participate is that they have seen some benefits already in this trial and don't want to wait to get hold of the drug. We feel that that's a very strong signal that there's something positive going on in, in with the drug in these patients that the, both the physician and the patient experience. That program was approved 30th of January and the first patient was just dosed and we uh, communicated that recently. Another finding here uh, that we have communicated from our HDAC inhibitor program is on our second development program, CSO 14. And last week we released a communication that we have been documenting that this HDAC inhibitor has had a dose-dependent impact on the very dangerous uh, changes in the pulmonary artery vessels. Uh, and we will hear more about that today by the head of those programs, Nick, Nicholas Oakes. That result we feel is underpinning our whole effort in this program towards the root case in cardiovascular disease, not only pH, but specifically pH in this case. In addition, of course, Friday evening, 8 of 8.40 p.m., we released a positive top-line results of our lead program, CS1. And we will, of course, focus on that today. This morning, on the back of our findings, uh, our scientific platform, I should say, supporting the whole ambition into pH with HDAC inhibitors, uh, and then the findings in the CSO14 trial, and of course the top line results, we communicated that we have signed a partnership program together with Fluida, a cutting edge and a world leader specialist on uh, being able to visualize the reverse modeling that could take place in arteries with our drug. And we are very much looking forward to see the impact in the clinical setting uh, from that uh, microscope perspective, so to speak. This morning, we also communicated that we will hold a capital markets day on October 17th, so a couple of weeks from now. Um, and in, in Stockholm, that will also be webcast. And then there we will spend three hours together. Uh, and there will be more ample time to answer questions and elaborate on those. We will have guest speakers uh, at that conference that you would be uh, enlightened to hear more about uh, our programs, what we've seen in the future. Next, please. So let's focus now on our pH program and the top line results. Next, please. So, um, this program is phase 2A program, so the primary endpoint in such a program is safety and tolerability. So your drug is safe and well tolerable in a patient population. And that was met successfully in our trial, so we've met our primary endpoint. Another objective that we had with this trial was to uh, um, harvest signals of efficacy. And uh, we have seen very interesting uh, data and we're excited about th those. We have seen a 45% improvement in reveal risk score uh, and 71% of the patients were both improved or stable. With regards to functional class, we saw 33% of the patients improved and 86% of the patients were improved or stable. With regards to a, a hemodynamic parameter, pulmonary arterial pressure, in this case mean, as measured by CardioMEMS, we saw that 67% of the patients had a sustained pressure reduction at the end of the period, which was 12 weeks. Now, CS1 study data here, together with the preclinical information that we have on HDAC inhibitors, specifically our active compound, VPA and then now CSO14 are consistent with the reversing pathological remodeling that we aim to achieve with our drug. So uh, based on these results, uh, we believe we have a clear path forward. We will engage with regulatory authorities to pursue 
a pivotal trial, which will likely be a 2B3 trial. Next, please. So let's look at the agenda. And you can see we have a few points to cover. Uh, and this again will be fast, uh, uh, perhaps, but we would like to do this for you so you get more information before the capital markets day already. So let's move on. So the, this study, the phase 2A trial, had as an ambition to uh, recruit uh, 30 patients and study them over 12 weeks. And uh, in June 28, we communicated that a decision has been made to close patient recruitment for this trial, which was done on July 1st. And the steering committee had recommended uh, Sereno to do so, as we believed that we had enough information from the trial to move on with the next steps of our development program. This resulted in 25 patients randomized and 21 patients analyzed for efficacy. We'll get to those numbers specifically later in the presentation, uh, but th this is the background. Next, please. So again, back to the results of the trial. So primary endpoint of safety and tolerability were met successfully. What does that mean? Well, we had good safety and tolerability profile, no CS1-related serious adverse events, including hospitalization and mortality, no CS1-related changes in liver lab values, and no CS1-related clinical significant drug-related plat platelets decrease or bleedings. If we move on to tolerability, CS1 was well tolerated in the study. We'll get to more detail later on in the presentation. Next. With regards to the secondary uh, ambition of this trial, let's look at the uh, um, three main uh, impacts that we've had in this trial uh, and our, has communicated this far. So reveal risk score, uh, we have an improvement in nine of 21 pa patients. 71% uh, of 15 out of 21 were improved or stable. And we will get into what does it mean to improve risk score? It has implications. If you're able to do that, you're doing something good for the patients specifically when it comes to risk for the future. Now, functional class, we had seven out of 21 patients improved functional class and 18 out of 21 stayed in their class or improved. What does that mean? Well, functional class is how the patient actually has physical capacity to live. And uh, we'll get into this. And I think uh, Raul Agraval will uh, you know, explain more what that means as we move on. Uh, so those two important parameters, reveal risk or functional class, we saw uh, quite some improvement here or st stability. If we move on to a specific parameter of hemodynamics, we saw that 14 out of 21 or 67% of the patients had a sustained pressure reduction at the end or over the period of the trial, which was 12 weeks. And this as measured by the CardioMEMS technology, which we have implanted in these patients in a collaboration effort with Abbott, who owns the technology. So very good results for us, we believe. Let's move on. Now let's go into pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's a progressive debilitating and fatal disease no spontaneous improvement that's important to note it's a uh, one road downhill until these patients after seven and a half year mean will not survive the trial uh, the the, uh, the disease there is no cure except for lung transplantation today let's move on looking at this so you have a healthy patient in the uh, animation to the right you have a healthy lung, then this patient is experiencing a pathological vascular remodeling. So the pulmonary arteries are getting more narrow and then you create, that creates a higher pressure in these arteries and it's difficult for the heart to pump. So life expectancy before therapy standard of care today was two and a half years only. 
Now, with therapy, standard of care, all therapy there is seven and a half years. None of the current drugs are actually addressing the root cause of the disease in any effective way. Um, next, please. So what happens is that you have a healthy vessel. This is pulmonary artery. And when you get early stage, it's more narrow. And then the, the pro disease progresses and you get a very narrow lumen and a high pressure. And if you look to the right here, the pathophysiology goes through endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, fibrosis, which causes these vessels to be less compliant or flexible. And some plexiform lesions appear. And then you have vasoconstriction, you have vascular and right ventricular uh, or right heart hypertrophy. And the clinical consequence of this is that the risk score and functional class in these patients deteriorates. Next, please. I should say that HDAC drive this development. Now, pH management goals is, of course, to improve the risk score measured by REVEAL is to improve symptoms and physical capacity as measured by functional class, and it's to improve hemodynamics as measured by pulmonary pressure and other measures. So CS1, our lead drug, aims to reach the management goals by reversing pathological remodeling and achieve the goals above. Next. So more specifically, risk or status you'd like to improve. You'd like to improve the functional class. If possible, then of course, hemodynamics. Often the key um, parameter here is pulmonary vascular resistance, which makes the difficult for blood to flow and for the right heart to pump. And the mean pulmonary arterial pressure in those vessels to go down. You'd like to improve right ventricular function and if you achieve these, you will extend survival in these patients. Next. So the key unmet needs is that no drugs really address the root cause of the disease. You would like to introduce that to the patients, and you would like to do so with a safe and more tolerable treatments that are currently on the market. CS1, our lead drug, aims to address these needs. Next. So what's the scientific rationale for conducting phase or phase 2a trial? Well, there is preclinical data. Epigenetic modulation through HDAC inhibition provides an attractive proposition to address the root cause of pH. Documentation of prevention and reversal of pathological remodeling and documentation of pulmonary arterial pressure reduction, all of this exists. Next. So HDAC inhibition has the capacity and the characteristics to reverse pathological remodeling. It is an antifibrotic, it is anti-inflammatory, it's been documented to reduce pulmonary pressure, and it is an antithrombotic without increased bleeding risk. Now, the majority of the data which is published has been published in the Lancet healthy longevity in a review article with the 100 most important articles behind this scientific platform. Next. So back here to what we would like to do and believe we are doing with our drug, the HDAC inhibitor CS1. You can see here the progression I showed before and you see the blue line going back. So you'd like to prevent deterioration and then reverse this disease. So with the objective to improve the risk or and functional class. And this would be done by the parameters to the right, the characteristics of the drug that's already published. Next. So looking at published data on our active ingredient VPA, you can see to the left here two graphs that has documented that you both can prevent and reverse uh, the medial wall thickness in animals, in rats, in pH model. And it's also measured here as vascular occlusive score. And this compared to control. And if you look to the right, the first graph, it's also been documented here that you can reduce the mean pulmonary arterial pressure in these models. Next. Now, so what you'd like to do again, if you look to the right, the goal, the clinical goal of therapy is to improve 
the risk or improvement of the functional class. So if you could prevent progression, which is the middle here, you would stop the de deterioration of these patients and that will make them have a better quality of life and live longer. If possible, you'd like to reverse the pathological remodeling like was seen in the animal work. Next. So by that uh, introduction, I'd like to introduce our head of R&D and chief medical officer, Dr. Raul Agraval, please. Thank you very much, Stan. Allow me to go into a few details of the design and the goals of it to put things into perspective. I would like to go, of course, uh, first into the primary endpoint of safety and tolerability. You already heard the very good results we have had and that we have met the primary endpoint. I'd like to briefly go also into the explore the efficacy parameters and the signals of reverse remodeling, what we took, why it is important. And of course, looking at these two, and you have already heard about the good results we have, we are preparing and to pursue a pivotal trial in collaboration with the regulatory authorities, the FDA and EMA. You're all aware of the phase 2A trial design. The primary endpoint is and was safety and tolerability, which you have successfully met. We had also, of course, introduced exploratory endpoints like the validated risk score. I'll go into more detail in there. Functional class and hemodynamics. For the hemodynamics, we used a very innovative method, CardioMEMS, which will allow a continuous measurement of hemodynamic parameters. I'll go into more detail there as well. Initially, we had planned for 30 patients, but as you heard from Stan, at the uh, evaluation of the clinical steering committee, we stopped the trial at 25 patients at 10 US clinical sites. We had three dosages of 480, 960, and 1920 milligrams. But because, of course, due to the small size of the study, we pooled the data. And number two, we also pulled it because our PK, PD, PD data indicated that we had already reached at the lowest dosage, the maximum efficacious exposure. Our treatment period, and please keep that in mind, was 12 weeks. Many of the studies in PH, phase three trials later on, were 24 weeks. So please look at it in that perspective. All in all, as we had said, we have 25 randomized patients. That means 25 patients are used for the safety analysis. For the efficacy parameters, we have used 21 patients. It is called per protocol. That's a technical word. What does that mean? That means all in all, we had 25 patients in the trial. However, four patients did not complete the trial. There were uh, three of them were already terminated and one had a protocol deviation. But none of it was study drug related. One patient uh, withdrew consent. One patient had sepsis that is a, a inflammation practically of the body and of blood. So that was unrelated to the drug. A third one uh, had symptoms for which they withdrew. And as you know, these patients are multimorbid. They take many drugs and it was unspecific reasons for that. A fourth patient had to be excluded because of protocol deviation as that patient was taking certain medications that were not allowed. So all in all, 25 patients were randomized, and we have used that for the safety analysis, 21 for the efficacy analyses, but the four that had to be excluded were not out of drug-related reasons. This is the baseline, if I may just briefly show. It is very representative of the pH population. We had a distribution of nearly 75% were female. Uh, we had a good race distribution. Most of the patients were, and that was inclusion criteria, in function class 2, 40%, and class 3, the rest, that is 60%. So allow me to briefly go into the details and also the importance of it. 
As you heard already from Stan, we're delighted to share that we have met the primary endpoint successfully, and we have a good safety and tolerability profile. If you look at the primary endpoint, we did not have a single uh, drug-related serious adverse event, as you, which you see on the highlighted gray box, which is again a very good news. Regarding the safety, further safety and tolerability profile, we did not see any CS1 related serious adverse events, including hospitalizations or mortality. We did not see any CS1 related changes in liver lab values. And we did not see any CS1 related clinically significant drug related platelet decreases or bleedings, something which, of course, everyone looks at. All in all, CS1 was well tolerated. So let us uh, now uh, turn our focus to the exploratory efficacy data. And I'd like to go into three areas, which already Stan has mentioned. First of all, reduction in the reveal risk score, improvement in functional class, and reduction in a hemodynamic parameter, that is the mean pulmonary artery pressure, measured with CardioMEMS from Abbott, who have, we have a close collaboration with, and there we measured area under the curve, which is AUC. So let us start with the reveal risk score. There are several uh, risk scores, but the reveal score has shown to have the highest prognostic power. The author of this reveal score is also our principal investigator, Professor Dr. Bensa. And here, uh, these data have been published. One can see that depending on in which uh, risk group one is, the mortality, morbidity is very high already within 12 months. Something which I would like to uh, draw your attention to is number one, that the reveal risk score includes all the various aspects that uh, are important in the diagnosis and treatment of pH patients, like uh, which uh, functional class they are, what are the comorbidities, vital signs. Six minute walk test is also included in the reveal risk score. Of course, lab values, uh, uh, imaging uh, values, function test, and invasive hemodynamic parameters like the right heart catheterization, which we also had. Second thing which I'd like to direct your attention to is the blue box on the right, that if one can have a one point reduction in the risk score in 12 weeks that is associated already with a 23% reduction of mortality at 12 months. I'd like to come back to this point on the next slide. What did we see? We saw that in the reveal score, keeping in mind that this is a progressive debilitating disease where patients have no spontaneous improvement, we saw that 43% had an improvement in the reveal risk score. That means at least one point uh, increase. And 29%, that means 29% uh, were stable. So all in all, over 70% had either an improvement or stabilization of uh, the reveal risk score. To put that into perspective, what I was saying on the last slide, a one point reduction in risk score within 12 weeks, and our study was for 12 weeks. This is associated with a 23% reduction in relative risk of death at 12 months. So these are very promising signs that we are doing something good here, taking the real risk score, which encompasses a lot of the aspects in the diagnosis and treatment of pH patients. If we look at another aspect, we've looked at the reveal risk score. How about the ability to move for the patients, which is functional class? 
On the right hand side, you see the criteria for functional class. Class one is when they have no complaints at rest. Class four is they're bedridden. Class two is that there is mild complaint if at movements and activity. And class three is they have marked or severe complaints at activity. So the goal is to improve the functional class. Practically, we had included two and three. So to improve it by at least one class, which would be lovely. What we see is that we had in 33%, that is seven out of 21, of an improvement of functional class. And we had all in all, 86%, that means 18 out of 21, which either improved or were stable in their functional class. Please keep in mind again, that it is a progressive disease where there's actually no spontaneous improvement. So this is again, a very promising sign. And functional class, of course, affects the daily activity of the patients. The more they can move, the better they feel. So this is of course, also something very important, which should be considered. Allow me maybe then to go into the hemodynamics, but before I do that in detail, I would just briefly like to tell you how we measured it. So what we did is we used CardioMEMS in close collaboration with Abbott. CardioMEMS is a device which permits daily non-invasive monitoring of the pulmonary artery pressure. It does it in that it measures it on a daily level, and then one can, in a wireless method, just uh, call that off. Uh, the patients have a device through lying on a certain mat. Uh, one can record it and then build, of course, a area under the curve, because usually what one does is for 20 seconds, the patients lie on the mat that is taken as an average. And since our trial was for 12 weeks, we have approximately 85 measurements of these. So we have all in all over 1,500 measurements per patient, which is a lot of data, which is objective data that we have collected of these patients. And what did we get there? Stan already mentioned that briefly. We have sustained reduction of mean pulmonary artery pressure, MPAP, area under the curve, AUC, in two thirds of the patients, that means 14 out of 21. You can see on the left-hand side of your screen, the bars that are going down, that means there's a reduction of mean pulmonary artery pressure. What does that mean? That means with the lowering of pulmonary artery pressure, the heart has sort of a less effort to work against it. This is a good sign. You see in the middle, a green uh, graph bar, and that is actually, the patient that we had reported approximately one year ago, the remarkable patient case. That patient had shown already a very impressive reduction in uh, MPAP, but you can see that there were many other patients who also had even a more pronounced mean pulmonary artery pressure. Allow me to briefly uh, just show you what that means on this slide. On the left-hand side on the y-axis, you see the units, which is mean pulmonary artery pressure, area under the curve, days one to 85. What we have done is we have put these all together, and then you see the number of minus 400, minus 200. What you have to do to compare it to others is then divide this by 85. What does that mean? That means the special patient, the remarkable patient that we had, which is the green uh, bar, had approximately a reduction of around two and a half, three millimeters of mercury, and it goes up to five millimeters mercury. What does that mean? I'd like to put that into perspective and show you another independent trial, which was looking at the pulmonary arterial diastolic pressure, which is similar, not exact the same thing, but similar. And here it was deemed that this is an independent predictor of mortality. If I may divert your attention to the left-hand side where you see on the black bars, which are going downwards, if one reduces the mean pulmonary artery pressure by three or four or five, you can see the mortality goes down by 19 or 24 or 30 percent. 
And we have that in our study where we have patients who have a reduction of mean pulmonary artery pressure of somewhere around two and a half to up to five. So again, very promising data, which we see because a reduction of MPAP is associated with a decreased mortality risk. So all in all, allow me to summarize. Primary endpoint of safety and tolerability met successfully. We have compelling positive impact on exploratory clinical parameters. And I would like to stress here, this is already over a 12 week treatment period. This is something to be remembered. Reveal risk score, we saw that 43%, that is nine out of 21, had an improvement in the risk score and 71%, that's 15 out of 21, either improved or had a stable risk score. And I showed you the importance of that. Functional class shows the level of activity possible, 33%. That means seven out of 21 improved in functional class already over the 12 weeks. And all in all, 86%, that is 18 out of 21, had either an improvement or stable functional class. And when we look at the hemodynamics, where we have a continuous monitoring, so very exact measurement of the hemodynamics, we saw that 67%, that is 14 out of 21, had sustained pressure reduction. So very much in line with what we already reported earlier, one year ago. And this is, of course, again, very promising in this small study. I would like to maybe share with you a quote, and we're also going to hear from Dr. Gusha, who is one of the most active investigators in our trial, uh, who was very pleased with it. And due to the results of what he saw in his patients, he's also someone who very much wanted his patients, and the patients also voiced that, they wanted to be in the compassionate use. Actually, all of his patients have said that they want to continue the treatment with CS1. And maybe we can just briefly share what Dr. Gusha has to share with us. I am very pleased with the positive outcomes we are seeing in our patients following treatment with CS1. Their improvements in health and well-being are encouraging and reflect the potential effectiveness of the therapy. This progress reaffirms my commitment to advancing treatments that can make a meaningful difference in patients' lives with PAH. Okay, so thank you very much for playing that. And this shows actually, and he's only representative, and we have heard that from other investigators as well, the, the, the positive impact that they see uh, and they would like to continue their patients in the compassionate use program. So we are seeing very encouraging signs in the clinical trial in this phase 2A trial. What I would like to now go is uh, and hand over to my dear colleague, uh, Nick, who is head of our preclinical development on where we see some evidence uh, and that we would like to share with you. Nick, allow me to hand over to you. So th thank you very much, Raul. It's it's a it's a really a great pleasure to be part of this webcast and share some more insights that we've gained from both combining our preclinical data as with our clinical data, as well as diving more deeply into some of the clinical data that we have. So uh, just just to sort of go through in brief what I'm going to talk about in this section. Um, I, I will refer to some very recent in-house evidence of reverse remodeling from preclinical data. I'll then talk about pulmonary vascular resistance, which is our indirect measure of reverse remodeling from the CS1 phase two trial and also then go into a group of remarkable responders that we have in the study um, showing evidence consistent with reverse remodeling and also improved right ventricular function in, in the CS1 phase two trial. And then 
also, I will just finish off with some data that suggests that perhaps, you know, we have already achieved the therapeutic uh, exposures needed to, to obtain this reverse remodeling at rather low doses. So next slide. So first of all, I want to share with you some really beautiful um, uh, preclinical data from a very closely related compound, CSO14. Why do we think this is relevant? Well, because this compound has equimolar potency to CS1, and we know from a lot of um, preclinical data that not only is it equipotent on the primary target, which is HDAC1 or HDAC inhibition, but it is also um, equipotent in several other um, measures of efficacy. So just to, this, this slide speaks to a particular pathophysiologic feature of PAH, which is really a hallmark of the pathophysiology of, of PAH, and that's shown in the histological um, pictures on the right-hand side. And if we compare the healthy situation, which is which is the picture on the to the left, um, you see that what's depicted here is a cross section through a small artery of about 100 micrometers in diameter, and that's in the centre of the field that you see, and surrounding that are the terminal air sacs that make up. The, the lung tissue. And you can see that this artery is, is basically um, very empty. There, it has a thin wall and there is no obstruction to the blood that would be flowing through it. In contrast, what you see to the right in this figure is a so-called plexiform lesion. Now here, the endothelial cells have proliferated and occupied this central lumen of the artery. They make this it very difficult for blood to throw, flow through this vessel. And again, I, this is really a classic feature of clinical PAH. And if we now look at the data where these the occurrence of these kinds of vessels has been quantified, um, in a, in a well-used animal model, so this is the Sugan hypoxia rat model, which has been used for basically every principle clinically used today uh, for PAH. What you can see is leftmost histogram is the normal healthy animals where the occurrence of these is practically zero. And then in the untreated um, placebo group, you can see that there is a high occurrence of these plexiform lesions. And then when we treat with this, well, the active ingredient of CS1's analog, CSO14, we see a very nice and robust dose-dependent reduction in the occurrence of these plexiform lesions. Next slide, please. Oh, I should also say that in the histology, we also noted a marked reduction in fibrosis in the surrounding the, the vessels. Sorry about that. So next slide, please. So now, now back, I want to take you back to the clinical trial results with CS1. And we can't in in this data that we have today talk, speak about plexiform lesions, but instead we talk about a parameter that reflects the degree to which the vessels are obstructed in these patients. And that parameter is the pulmonary vascular resistance, as Rahul mentioned previously. And Basically, on the, on the left-hand side of this diagram, you see the progressive uh, obstruction of vessels with the pathogenesis of the disease. And then underneath 
these sort of cartoon diagrams of the, the small arteries being blocked. You see how hypothesis that CS1 will reverse this uh, pathological change so that we will have more open vessels, precisely as I've shown you from preclinical data. So PVR is the hemodynamic parameter that best reflects reverse remodeling. Okay, to the data on the right-hand side, what you see in this figure is, is all of the data for all the individuals, all the individual patients um, plotted here for PVR. And what's what's shown on the x-axis is the pre-treatment baseline value of PVR in Woods units plotted against on the y-axis the end treatment uh, PVR in the, in the patients. So that um, if there was no alteration in PVR, with treatment and no variation, then all of these points would lie along this uh, diagonal line, the red line. So if we take as, a, as an example, there's a minus 50% shown here. This individual patient had a value in Woods units of 12 before being treated and six at the end of treatment. And actually, this is an absolutely remarkable change in PVR that we saw in this individual. And there were several other patients who also showed very large changes. Next slide, please. So, and what I've done in this slide is just to highlight the patients that uh, had large changes, and these are shown um, encompassed in this rectangle. And these individual patients showed reductions in PVR of between 35 and 51 percent, with a mean of 45 percent. Now, those of those patients that responded like that, four out of five of them were actually in the low dose group. Now, how likely is it that we would see changes like this? Well, it turns out that it's extremely unlikely that we would see these by chance. In fact, it's 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 we compared the um, these reductions with. Uh, standard of care treated placebo groups from a much bigger trial, the Stella uh, study, uh, which had hundreds of, of patients instead of um, in our trial, and we're able to conclude statistically that the chances of this kind of reduction are extremely small. So next slide, please. Now, when we actually take those patients patients who responded and try and understand what else happened in these patients that stood out. Um, and specifically, was there any evidence that right ventricular function was improved in those patients? So we could see that there was a very strong inverse relationship between the change in stroke volume in those patients and the reduction in PVR. And, and this group we're calling the remarkable responder group. And so if we just take a look at this figure that is shown here, what we've plotted is the change in stroke volume on the y-axis versus the change in PVR on the x-axis. So those patients who responded remarkably are shown in this green field on the upper left hand side of, of the figure. So what you can see is that as PVR was reduced in those individuals, the stroke volume markedly increased. And if we try and understand were these changes in stroke volume significant? Yes, they were because we, have, we know from the literature that changes of greater than 10 millilitres 
in stroke volume are clinically significant, meaning that those patients have improved outcomes. And what we could see was that the changes were greater than 10 milliliters in all of these patients. So we can conclude then that reduction in, there, we saw in these PVR remarkable responders, a reduction in PVR and an increase in stroke volume. They were clinically meaningful in magnitude, the increases in stroke volume, and that we have evidence that remodeling results in, in, in uh, it should be decreased, uh, oh, sorry, remodeling results in increased PVR. So this is the, the, the impact of the disease and worsened right function. That's shown by this red constriction in the diagram below and that CS1 reduces PVR and improves right heart function. Next slide. Now, just bringing together all of the data that we have, so the preclinical data as well as the clinical data, and reminding ourselves CSO14 is an equipotent analogue of the active ingredient of CS1. So what we've done in this slide or in this diagram to the left is to compare the exposures that were needed in order to see the reverse remodeling effects, including the reduction in um, the plexiform lesions. So that, that's represented by the green field um, at the bottom of that graph, and the upper line in the green field represents the maximally efficacious exposure needed to achieve this reverse remodeling. And so what we could see was if we compare these exposures for the preclinical studies against the exposures that were achieved in the clinical studies, we could see that we are far above uh, the exposures needed at the high dose and slightly above them at the mid dose. So the maximally effective preclinical unbound exposures correspond to the low to mid dose levels in our phase 2A clinical trial. And the majority of these remarkable PVR responders are actually in the low dose group. So next slide. So just to summarize what I've told you here then, so recently obtained preclinical data with CSO14, again, a very close analog equipotent to the active ingredient of CS1, demonstrates a dose-dependent reversal of remodeling of lung resistance arteries in a PAH model, a dose-dependent reduction of plexiform lesions, a reduction of fibrosis associated with pulmonary arteries, and maximal efficacy at equivalent exposures to CS1 phase 2 trial lower dose range. 24% of the patients responded to CS1 with remarkably large reductions in PVR, consistent with the proposed reversal of pathological vascular remodeling. And these reductions in PVR between 35 and 51% were strongly associated with robust increases in the right ventricular stroke volume of greater than 10 milliliters. So next slide. So with that, I'd like to hand back to Stan to wrap up uh, the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, now let's go to the conclusions. So we have positive top line result of the phase 2A trial with the lead candidate CS1 in PH. Next. And you have heard this data several times. I won't repeat it, but basically saying that we have met successfully the safety and the tolerability. 
we have both in reveal risk score, which is very important for prognosis, functional class, which is very important for quality of life, and MPAP, which is a prognostic factor for these patients, very good data. CS1 study together with preclinical information is consistent with reversing pathological remodeling. So we have a clear path forward and we are engaging with regulatory authorities to, with the aim to pursue a pivotal trial of this drug in PH. Next. So what is the path? Well, we're going to complete the analysis of the trial. Uh, we have announced a Fluidas collaboration, uh, compassionate use, what's happening with that, and then regulatory path. Next slide, please. So we will complete the analysis of the PH trial, possibly come back with more data to uh, the market, and we'll, of course, take that data in our discussions with the FDA. Our regulatory path is to aim for a pivotal trial, but this data and uh, our uh, aim is also to get uh, faster regulatory processes, if we can, for the drug. With regards to compassionate use, we have one patient dose so far and communicated that, uh, and we aim to have that uh, data to show us clinically and other parameters what will uh, CS1 be able to achieve, if we have achieved this in 12 weeks, what we will be able to achieve in longer studies, six months or a year. That will be very exciting to follow. Fluida partnership to document the impact of our drug on reversal modeling, which Nick so elegantly has communicated with you today. We'd like to see the drug studied with the cutting edge technology on the pulmonary arteries in man in the clinical setting. And we aim to do that over long term use. And some of these patients will be the compassionate use patients. So that will be excellent to see. Next. So this is the technology and just showing you the press release to the left this morning of the collaboration with Fluida and how it looks if you have a healthy pulmonary artery grid of vessels around and in the lungs. And you can see what happens to the right to these vessels in pH. So this is what we'd like to see. Can we prog uh, prevent progression or reverse into the left picture perhaps? Next. So um, concluding there, the, um, the um, uh, communication around the top line data and in-depth analysis, let's look at Sereno and the path forward for the company. So of course we had, as I mentioned up front, a portfolio of uh, programs. And um, let's look at some key upcoming milestones that are interesting. Next, please. Yes, so I show this up front. So we have this portfolio, uh, our PH program, which is getting exciting, more exciting by the day, I would say, CS1. Uh, and then we have our portfolio, and now we have some very interesting data beyond reduction or prevention of uh, thrombosis without bleed with CSO14. We also have an impact, a dose-dependent impact on uh, plexiform lesions and the pulmonary arteries. Uh, so the portfolio is, to from our perspective, hot. Uh, and then, of course, thrombosis prevention we have documented for our novel agent from University of Michigan, uh, a prevention of thrombosis without increasing risk of bleed, as has been done also with CSO14, as I mentioned. So we hope and we believe that this will be an attractive portfolio to discuss with possible partners, discussions that are already ongoing, I would say, without going into any details. Our company in our portfolio has been exposed to a uh, several or many companies, I would say, over the, this year in the start and, and as we have moved into the fall, expecting our top line data. Next. So key upcoming milestones, the compassionate use program, long term data in the first part of next year. CS1 FDA pivotal study approval, we expect to get uh, on the first part, we hope so, uh, of next year. Reverse remodeling impact of a drug in human pulmonary arteries as measured with Fluidas technology uh, in the beginning of next year. 
uh, or uh, beginning of the year, I should say, in the spring. And then CSO 14 phase one completion is targeted for uh, end of Q2. And CSO 14 phase two approval by the end of next year. And of course, continued partnering, collaboration or M&A activities. Next. So by that, you know, I'd like to conclude the presentation and uh, hope you found it uh, interesting or, and you're all excited. And um, I'll let uh, open up the webcast Q&A session. And before we actually go into that, um, I'd like to mention here that we have quite a short um, session here. Uh, in uh, in respect to the time that we have available. But you would also be welcome to send questions to this email here, our IAR responsible, Henrik Vestal, serenoscientific.com, and we'll do our best to answer those to you uh, and publish them in some uh, frequently asked questions uh, on our website. In addition, as communicated here, we have a Capital Markets Day uh, October 17th at uh, 1.30 p.m. in Stockholm that will also be streamed. And we expect to have an extensive session on questions and uh, answers with uh, our people that are active either over Teams or on stage that day. So um, now let's uh, open this for uh, questions from the audience and analysts first. If you wish to ask a question, please dial pound key five on your telephone keypad to enter the queue. If you wish to withdraw your question, please dial pound key six on your telephone keypad. The next question comes from Joseph Hedden from RX Securities. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions and congratulations on this very encouraging data. Um, so Sten, I think you uh, alluded a, a bit at the end to it. it would be great to see what happens with longer treatment periods. Um, so I was just interested if you had any, if you could share any details about how quick were the reductions in pressure that you saw in responders in the trial and did you see deepening responses over the course of 12 weeks indicating that maybe with longer treatment periods these the, the, these patients could be doing even better and better uh, it's a good question i um i want to uh, give this over to dr raul Ag agraval our cmo uh, and i should you know of course point out here that the pressures that you see as measured with auc is actually the pressure load. So, you know, the, the mean PAP here, uh, reduction that you see multiplied by days uh, measured is the load on the right ventricle. Uh, and that's why the, the documentation here of two or three to five has a significant impact from 20 to 30% reduction in, in um, uh, mortality over a period. As as uh, Dr. Raúl uh, Agraval mentioned, but Raúl, please uh, take the question forward. Sure. Thank you very much. And this is, of course, a very important aspect we are also looking into, keeping in mind. And I think you were alluding to that. We have only used twelve weeks so far, so we are really capturing promising signals, and we have received them, especially with the Cardiomens technology, which has allowed us to really capture a lot of data. And as I was saying, over 85, 90 days, we have captured nearly 1,500 data sets for these patients. And yes, we see very promising results. And if one keeps in mind, this is a progressive, continuous disease, we hope to see, of course, better and even more pronounced results over a longer treatment period, absolutely. Okay, great. And perhaps if I could uh, just follow up um, on, on the patients where you saw the most impressive uh, effect on PVR and, and the ones who are, you, you're calling the, the super responders, um, uh, do they correspond exactly to who has the biggest improvements on 
or who improved on reveal risk scores and who functional class so is everything perfectly aligned in that respect again i'll i'll leave that up sure. to you uh, raul to to sure. comment on Yes, I mean, in the best of worlds, we would have said everything is aligned, all the parameters are, but of course, patients react differently. As I had said, this is a very small trial. It's a phase 2A trial. So uh, several patients did show uh, also the reductions in hemo or improvements in hemodynamics in the right direction. But we're talking here, as Nick had uh, very nicely shown, about five, six patients currently. And we hope that in a larger group, we have a much more sustained sort of effect, and we can show that uh, in a more reliable fashion. Okay, so I hope that was uh, helpful, uh, Joseph. And uh, do we have other questions from the analyst audience? The next question comes from Aaron Artkar from Edison Group. Please go ahead. Hi there. Thanks very much for the presentation and for taking my question. Um, so your press release has sort of mentioned engaging with authorities for a pivotal trial. Um, just wanted to get your thoughts on if you think that one randomized trial will be sufficient for regulators based on the fact that Citatacept had two um, late stage trials. Thanks. It's a very good question. Thanks for being present and, and asking that one. And, and you know, I, I'm sure uh, here again, uh, Raul will, will answer. I can mention that uh, the approach with this kind of 2A data, the aim is likely a 2B3 trial. So, but, but, but again, I'll, I'll leave that to, to Raul to comment on. Thank you very much, Stan. And yes, this is a very important question. Please keep in mind that we're talking about a rare orphan indication. We already have orphan drug designation. So the authorities are very open to discuss, especially if the data points towards a safe and well-tolerated drug. As you know, there is experience with the uh, key component of CS1 uh, for many years, and we have shown good results. So we think we have very good data to go there and engage the regulatory bodies. And I have previous experience from my times when I was uh, at larger pharma companies, also in PH, where one can approach them and they're very open for an adaptive trial design, phase 2B3, as Stan was mentioning. And we think we have some very good arguments here. So we'll pursue this, absolutely. Any more Thanks question here? And the, one, one more, if I may. Um, so in terms of the next phases of development, uh, we see that you're open to sort of M&A options and licensing partners. Appreciate it's pretty early stage, but with the sort of two HDAC inhibitors that you've got in your portfolio, how do you see discussions playing out with sort of potentially interested parties? Is there a chance this could be um, for, for both assets, or do you think that you'll see these as individual programs going forward? Thank you. A very good question. And, you know, there is, of course, a, a, a strategy behind uh, Sereno uh, pursuing these two assets that is uh, five, I would say five, six years old. So we have our, you know, business uh, and development strategy uh, and we have obtained what we have uh, decided to pursue many years ago. So what you're seeing here playing out in data uh, from the PH trial with CS1, and you see data playing out in thrombosis with CSO14 before, and now plexiform lesions. It's all part of a, a plan that we keep close to our chest, but we believe that this will be an attractive HDAC portfolio for the majors pursuing cardiovascular disease with the ambition to be able to address the root cause of uh, the disease progression in several indications. So uh, that's our plan. And exactly how those discussions will play out, uh, we will have to see. Um, so we haven't really disclosed uh, the end or, or you know, uh, we're not discussing uh, the end of these 
uh, programs and the full totality of what can be pursued of these programs. We have previously communicated to the market and also to potential partners the uh, many indications that you can pursue if you have an impact on inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, um, uh, fibrosis, and uh, rem uh, vascular remodeling in the vessels and the heart. This is There are many patients in cardiovascular diseases that have this uh, complex pathophysiology uh, in various degrees. So agents that can do what we have seen so far with HDAC inhibition would be and will be very attractive, I think. Thanks very much. Um, no more questions and congrats again on the positive data. Thank you. Additional questions, perhaps? There are no more questions at this time. So I hand the conference back to the speakers for any written question. OK, uh, thank you. I don't know if I'm on. I have some questions that I've gotten into my phone. Bear with me. Uh, I think uh, many of these questions have been responded. I'll see here. Um, so could you please comment on the conclusion of the optimal dose being found in the lower dose and um, what's the hypothesis of this? I think Nick, Nick Oakes uh, uh, referred to this and uh, to some extent here. Um, so I think that question has already been answered. Why did you pool the doses is another question here. And perhaps Raul, you could take that question. Sure, very gladly. I had mentioned that briefly also in my presentation. We have pulled it A because we had seen the PKPD, that means pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics data, which were pointing in that direction. And number two, because of the small sizes in each group, we thought it is best to pull the data. So those were definitely good reasons to do so. Good. Thank you, Raul. And um, do you expect to see further improvement over a longer treatment period? I think that was just asked and answered. Um, now, um, uh, will you be sharing more information of the exploratory efficacy parameters as we move on, uh, you move on with your analysis? Uh, that is likely to happen, and we are planning, uh, hopefully planning here, an, a publication in, in a good journal or, or several. Uh, about that data, and we'll get more data coming out of the trial when we finalize the analysis into final report. Um, what are your next steps? Uh, when do you foresee that the pivotal trial can be initiated? Um, well, we hope that we'll be able to get a, a regulatory approval for our programs moving forward, uh, and we're aiming for a pivotal trial. We hope we'll get that approval by uh, the first half of next year, and then uh, preparations going on from now and moving towards a, a start of such a trial, which uh, we haven't really disclosed yet when that would be. I would I would offer here that it might be, you know, in the early 2026. Um, so possible sub-questions, what will the collaboration with Abbott look like after the trial? Uh, we've, we've had a very good collaboration with Abbott here in this trial, and we think one part of the very interesting data we have here is the CardioMEMS uh, sustained clinical uh, reduction of mean pulmonary arterial pressure over time with these 1,500 to 2,000 measurements points for each patient. Uh, now, the question is, of course, how will that uh, CardiMEMS technology be useful as we move forward in the programs. And I'll, I'll wait with that uh, until we have defined how that could be useful in our programs for getting this drug eventually to the patients through a pivotal trial. Um, I think those are the main questions here. Um, I don't know uh, if we have any other questions to address, I think we perhaps should close the Q&A session for now and um, just thank everyone for being part of this webcast and especially the shareholders for supporting our uh, journey to provide, develop and provide valuable therapeutics 
to patients that uh, are in their need of, of those and especially addressing root causes of diseases with safe and effective therapies. Please send your questions to this email, Henrik Westdahl, serenoscientific.com, and we'll try to answer them. And of course, we'd love for you to show up at our Capital Markets Day, either digitally, because it will be streamed, or in, uh, in person at Posthuset in Stockholm, 1.30 p.m. October the 17th. And by that, I'd like to conclude this webcast and uh, I hope you share the excitement of this data and Serenus future with our programs. Thank you.